Hi and welcome to parts 2 and 3 of my lecture on lower genital tract infections and we will discuss here infections of the vagina and the cervix. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Tokina Obigaine. Main reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology 7th edition chapter 23 genital tract infections. So, as I've said, this is the outline of my lecture, but um, for this video lecture, we will discuss um, infections of the vagina and infections of the cervix. So, now let's discuss infections of the vagina. So, first we have vaginitis. Vaginal discharge is the most common symptom in gynecology. Other symptoms associated with vaginal infection include superficial dyspareunia, dysuria, odor, and vulva burning and pruritus. The three most common causes of vaginitis are candidiasis or a fungal infection, a protozoan infection in the form of trichomonas or trichomoniasis, and a disruption of the vaginal bacterial ecosystem leading to bacterial vaginosis. So as you can see here, we can differentiate each of this um, vaginitis differential diagnosis by using pH. So first, let's talk about bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis is the most prevalent cause of symptomatic vaginitis. Bacterial vaginosis reflects a shift in vaginal flora from lactobacilli dominant two mixed flora including genital mycoplasmas, Gardnerella vaginalis, and anaerobes such as Peptostreptococci and Prevotella and Mobilinco species. Currently, bacterial vaginosis is described as a sexually associated infection rather than a truly or a true sexually transmitted infection. Histologically, there is an absence of inflammation in biopsies of the vagina, thus the term vaginosis instead of vaginitis. Bacterial vaginosis has been associated with upper tract infections including endometritis, PID, post of vaginal cuff cellulitis, and multiple complications of infection during pregnancy such as preterm rupture of membranes, endomyometritis, decreased success with IVF, and increased pregnancy loss of less than 20 weeks gestation. The most frequent symptom is an unpleasant vaginal odor, which patients describe as a musty or a fishy odor. And this is often stronger following intercourse when an alkaline semen results in the release of aromatic amines. Vaginal discharge associated with bacterial vaginosis is thin and gray-white, but sometimes it can also be yellowish in color. Speculum exam reveals that the discharge is mildly adherent to the vaginal walls. Now, for us to be able to diagnose bacterial vaginosis, we use the AMSELS criteria. And the AMSELS criteria has four criteria. So, first, a homogeneous vaginal discharge is present. Second, a vaginal discharge has a pH of 4.5 or higher. Third, the vaginal discharge has an amine-like odor when uh, mixed with potassium hydroxide, and this is what we call the WIF test. And fourth, a wet smear of the vaginal discharge demonstrates clue cells, more than 20% of the number of the vaginal epithelial cells. Now, um, for us to be able to diagnose bacterial vaginosis, we need to fulfill three out of the four criteria. Now, if available, we, gram staining of vaginal secretion is an excellent diagnostic method also. For the treatment of bacterial vaginosis, we usually give metronidazole, 500 mg BID for 7 days. We can also give tinidazole or metronidazole gel, a clindamycin cream, clindamycin oral, or clindamycin ovules. For recurrent bacterial vaginosis, that is a bacterial vaginosis that occurs three or more episodes in a year, we give 10 days of vaginal metronidazole followed by twice weekly use of 0.75% metronidazole gel for 16 weeks. Concurrent treatment of the male partner is not really recommended for bacterial vaginosis. Next, we have trichomonas vaginal infection or trichomoniasis. This is caused by the anaerobic flagellated protozoan trichomonas vaginalis and this infection is highly contagious. 
Trichomonas is a hardy organism and will survive for up to 24 hours on a wet towel and up to 6 hours on a moist surface. Primary symptom of trichomonas vaginal infection is profuse or copious vaginal discharge. The classic discharge of trichomonas infection is termed frothy, meaning it has the, the discharge has bubbles and often has a very unpleasant odor. The classic sign of a strawberry appearance of the upper vagina and cervix is rare and is noted in less than 10% of women with trichomonas vaginal infection. Previously, culture was considered the gold standard to detect trichomonas vaginalis and wet prep was the most commonly performed diagnostic test. Now, a uh, nucleic acid amplification tests are 3 to 5 times more sensitive than wet prep and a uh, nucleic acid amplification test can be performed on vaginal secretions or urine. Nitroimidazoles are the only class of drugs recommended for treatment of trichomonas vaginitis. So we can give single oral dose of metronidazole or timidazole, which is uh, what is recommended. Or we can give an alternate regimen of uh, metronidazole 500mg already, twice daily for 7 days, just like how we do it for bacterial vaginosis. Metronidazole is safe in all trimesters of pregnancy. Patients should be warned though that nitroimidazoles inhibit ethanol metabolism. So women should avoid alcohol for 24 hours after metronidazole and 72 hours after tinidazole therapy to avoid a disulfiram-like reaction. So topical therapy for trichomonas vaginitis is not recommended because it does not eliminate disease reservoirs in Bartholin and skin glands. Next, we have candida vaginitis. This is produced by a ubiquitous airborne gram-positive fungus. More than 90% of cases are caused by candida albicans. When the ecosystem of the vagina is disturbed, candida albicans can become an opportunistic pathogen. Hormonal factors, depressed cell in mediated immunity, and antibiotic use are the three most important factors that alter the vaginal ecosystem. Hormonal changes associated with pregnancy and menstruation favor the growth of the fungus. The prevalence of candida vaginitis increases throughout pregnancy, probably as a result of high estrogen levels. Lactobacilli inhibit the growth of fungi in the vagina, and therefore, when the relative concentration of lactobacilli declines, there is rapid overgrowth of candida species. Broad-spectrum antibiotics, especially those that destroy lactobacilli, such as penicillin, tetracycline, and or cephalosporins, are notorious for precipitating acute episodes of candida albicans vaginitis. The most important host factor is depressed cell-mediated immunity or women who take exogenous corticosteroids or for those women with AIDS. The greatest enigma of this condition is the recurrence rate after an apparent cure varying from 20 to 80 percent. Approximately 3 to 5 percent of these women experience recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, which is uh, when, when four or more documented episodes of candida vaginitis occur in one year. Pruritus is the predominant symptom of uh, candida vaginitis. The vaginal discharge is white or whitish gray, highly viscous, and described as granular or ocular with no odor. During speculum exam, a cottage cheese-type discharge is often visualized with adherent clumps and plaques, or what we call the thrush patches, attached to the vaginal walls. The vaginal pH associated with this infection is below 4.5 in contrast to bacterial vaginosis which, and trichomonas vaginitis, which are associated with an elevated pH, or a pH that's more than 4 more than 4.5. Diagnosis is established by obtaining a wet smear of vaginal secretion and mixing this with 10 to 20% potassium hydroxide. Now, the alkali rapidly lyses the red blood cells and inflammatory cells. Active disease is associated with lamentous forms, mycelia, or pseudohyphae rather than spores. Vaginal culture of candida is particularly useful when a wet mount is negative for hyphae, but the patients have symptoms and discharge 
or other signs suggestive of vulvovaginal candidiasis on examination. Fungal culture may also be useful for women who have recently treated themselves with an antifungal agent. So for the treatment, the CDC recommends placing the woman into an uncomplicated or complicated category to guide the treatment. So for the treatment, you can see here, we have a classification of a vulvovaginal candidiasis, whether it's uncomplicated or complicated VVC. So a number of azole vaginal preparations in a single oral agent, fluconazole, are approved for treatment. In patients with uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, topical antifungal agents are typically used for 1-3 to three days or a single oral dose of fluconazole. For patients with complicated vaginitis, topical azoles are recommended for 7-14 to 14 days. Now, if you use oral therapy, a second dose of fluconazole, that's 150mg tablet, given 72 hours after the first dose is recommended. In women with recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, the resolution of symptoms typically requires longer duration of therapy. 7 to 14 days of topical therapy or 3 doses of oral fluconazole 3 days apart are your options. After this treatment, maintenance therapy will help prevent recurrence of symptoms. Now, oral fluconazole weekly for 6 months is typically the first line of treatment. So, these are the available uh, diagnostic tests for vaginitis. So, as you can see here, for bacterial vaginosis, we can use a pH test or the AMSELS criteria. We can also, uh, sometimes you can also use pap smear you know, because sometimes uh, pathologists report the presence of bacterial vaginosis on pap smear. We can also use the wet mount for candida, pH test, and also pap smear. And for trichomonas vaginalis, we can use wet mount, culture, pH test, pap smear. Now we go to toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock syndrome or TSS is an acute febrile illness produced by a bacterial exotoxin with a fulminating downhill course involving dysfunction of multiple organ systems. The cardinal features are abrupt on onset and rapidity with which the clinical signs and symptoms may present and progress. A woman with TSS may develop a rapid onset of hypotension associated with multi-organ system failure. Staph aureus was isolated from the vagina in more than 90% of these cases. Non-menstrual TSS may be a sequela of focal staphylococcal infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue, often following a surgical procedure. There are three requirements for the development of classic TSS. First, the woman must be colonized or infected with staph aureus. Second, the bacteria must produce TSS toxin 1 or related toxins. And the third, the toxins must have a route of entry to the systemic circulation. Signs and symptoms of TSS are produced by the exotoxin, toxin 1. Gynecologists should have a high index of suspicion for TSS in a woman who has unexplained fever and a rash during or immediately following her menstrual period. Usually, the patient experiences an abrupt onset of a high temperature associated with headache, myalgia, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized skin rash, and often hypotension. And these are the case definition of toxic shock syndrome. The most characteristic manifestations of toxic shock syndrome are the skin changes. During the first 48 hours, the skin rash appears similar to intense sunburn. During the next few days, the erythema will become more macular and resemble a drug-related rash. Now, from days 12 to 15 of the illness, there is a fine, flaky desquamation of the skin over the face and the trunk with sloughing of the entire skin thickness of the palms and the soles. During pelvic exam, patients complain of tenderness of the external genitalia and vagina. And these are the laboratory abnormalities in early toxic shock syndrome. 
The management of a classic case of severe DSS demands an intensive care unit and the skills of an expert in critical care medicine. The first priority is to eliminate the hypotension produced by the exotoxin. Copious amounts of IV fluids are given while pressure and volume dynamics are centrally monitored. Mechanical ventilation is required for women who develop adult respiratory distress syndrome. When the woman is initially admitted to the hospital, it is important to obtain cervical, vaginal, and blood cultures for staff or use. It is prudent to wash out the vagina with saline or dilute iodine solution to diminish the amount of exotoxin that may be absorbed into the systemic circulation. Treatment for TSS, so women with TSS caused by methicillin-susceptible uh, SRUs, should be treated with clindamycin 600 mg IV every 8 hours plus nafcelin or oxacillin 2 grams IV every 4 hours. Most experts recommend a 1-2 to two week course of therapy with an anti-staphylococcal agent such as clindamycin or dicloxacillin even in the absence of a positive S. aureus culture. In patients with TSS caused by methicillin-resistant S. aureus, clindamycin plus vancomycin or linezolid is used. The infected site should be drained and debrided. Treatment with mupirocin to decrease colonization is recommended, applying half of the ointment from a single-use tube into one nostril and the other half into the other nostril twice daily for five days. Now we go to infections of the cervix. So we have cervicitis. So this can be associated with trauma, inflammatory systemic disease, neoplasia, and infection. The cervix and cervical mucus acts as a barrier between the abundant bacterial flora of the vagina and the bacteriologically sterile endometrial cavity and oviducts. Cervical infection can be ectocervicitis or endocervicitis. Ectocervicitis can be viral or from a severe vaginitis or candida albicans. Endocervicitis may be secondary to infection with chlamydia trachomatis or Neisseria gonorrhea. Infection of the endocervix becomes a major reservoir for sexual and perinatal transmission of pathogenic microorganisms. Primary endocervical infection may result in secondary ascending infections, including PID, and perinatal infections of the membranes, amniotic fluid, and parametria. Next, we have mucopurulent cervicitis. Two simple definitive objective criteria have been developed to establish mucopurulent cervicitis. So first is the gross visualization of yellow mucopurulent material on a white cotton swab. And second is the presence of 10 or more uh, PMN leukocytes per microscopic field on gram-stained smears obtained from the endocervix. Symptoms that suggest cervical infection include vaginal discharge, deep dyspareunia, and postcoital bleeding. The physical sign of a cervical infection is a cervix that is hypertrophic and edematous. Chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea are the most common cause of cervical infection in many women with mucopurulent cervicitis. The gold standard for the diagnosis is a nucleic acid amplification test. When mucopurulent cervicitis is clinically diagnosed, empirical therapy for chlamydia trachomatis is recommended for women at the at increased risk of this common STI. Recommended regimens for presumptive cervicitis therapy include azithromycin, 1 gram orally in a single dose, doxycycline, 100 mg orally twice daily for 7 days, and add gonococcal treatment if the prevalence is over 5% in the population assessed. Women treated with chlamydia should be instructed to abstain from sexual intercourse for 7 days after single dose therapy or after or until completion of the 7-day regimen. And here is a CDC recommended dual treatment of uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the cervix, urethra, and rectum in adults. And on the right are the recommended regimens for the treatment of chlamydial infection. So that's it for this lecture series on the lower genital tract infections. So part 1, we had a video lecture on infections of the vulva. And this lecture, this video lecture, for part 2 on infections of the vagina and the cervix. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokinao Obigaine.